Professor Malik Peris is a clinical and public health virologist with a particular interest in emerging virus diseases at the animal-human interface using a One Health approach including influenza, coronavirus and others. Is COVID-19 fatal to everyone? So the current uh, statistics provided by WHO and also from China suggests uh, a death rate of about 2 to 3 percent of people who are diagnosed with the disease. Now, but that is probably uh, too, uh, too high because the mild cases who do not end up in hospital are not being counted, right? So the current uh, estimates of 2 to 3 percent are probably much too high. So that is one point. But even within those statistics, it is important to realize that the people under 50 years of age very rarely die from this infection, right? I mean, children, in fact, are very mild. They don't even need to go into hospital. As you get older and older, the severity of the disease increases, but most of the deaths have occurred over the age of 60, or even over the age of 70. So even with these um, uh, death rates uh, or the statistics reported from China, the, the fatality rate in the 60 to 70 year age group is only 3.6% or 4%. In the 70 to 80 age group is about 8%. And over 80, it's about 15%. But under 60, it is very low, less than 1%. Right? And as I said, even that is probably an overestimate. So uh, particularly young adults really don't have to worry uh, too much about this disease. But having said that, it is a new disease. It is spreading quite rapidly and it is going to cause significant impact globally. So we need to take precautions, but not necessarily panic about it. Children seem less vulnerable to COVID-19. Is there a particular reason for this? Who are the high risk, highly susceptible to death? Um, so the most of the deaths uh, from this virus have occurred in the older population, older than 60 years or so. And of course, also uh, these uh, people who have underlying diseases, other diseases such as underlying heart disease, underlying lung disease, uh, diabetes. So uh, people who have other underlying diseases are at greater risk to bad outcomes following infection with this uh, coronavirus. Um, so I think what we see is that children can get infected, but they, they don't have very severe disease. So it can be very mild. Uh, so that is why these patients are not being recognized. Not that children do not get infected, but because they do not develop a significant disease even enough to go and see a doctor. Uh, now, what we don't know is whether children who get infected can transmit even though they have mild disease. So that we do not know. But, but the reason um, why we don't have many children being reported with the disease is because the, the, the disease is so mild or, or the infection is so mild is it a good practice to wear the same face mask for two to three days? Right, so face masks are of course very useful when you're working in a hospital uh, to protect uh, the hospital workers from patients. They are also useful in reducing transmission from people who have the disease. Right, so uh, somebody who has COVID-19 or even influenza, they are coughing and sneezing and the use of a face mask on the infected person can reduce transmission to other people. However, there is no evidence at all that face masks worn by healthy people out in the community has any benefit, right? So that is point number one. Uh, now, having said that, if there is somebody who's looking after a sick person, even in the home, uh, and that person does have, uh, say, a COVID-19 disease, then, of course, 
the caregiver uh, should wear a face mask. But just wearing face masks when you are you know, going about your normal activities, um, there is no uh, logic to that, no evidence behind that. Now, in addition to that, it is quite important to understand that if you don't use the face mask properly, you can actually be increasing your risk. So, for example, what a face mask does is that when you're near somebody who is infected uh, and that person is maybe coughing virus out at you, uh, if you have a face mask, the, the virus will get deposited on the outside of the face mask. Now, if you uh, take it out and you touch the outside and then you maybe touch your eyes or mouth or nose, you will then transfer the infection to yourself, right? So just because you have a face mask, if you don't use it properly, you're not protecting yourself. And definitely, if you are using the same face mask two or three days, that means you're not using it properly. Basically, using a face mask properly means you put it on uh, 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 and, and then adjust it correctly so that you, you have your nose uh, tightly covered with the, with the face mask. And uh, you don't touch the front of the face mask as long as you're using it. Uh, at the end of your period of use, you remove the face mask carefully, turn it inside out. So that means the outside is turned inside. You, you dispose of it into a, a waste container and then go and wash your hands. If you don't do that properly, actually the face mask can be more uh, increasing risk than reducing risk. Are there any medicines or a vaccine available and how is the progress of a vaccine development against COVID-19? There are some uh, medicines that have been used for SARS, uh, which is a related coronavirus, and also for MERS, which was another coronavirus causing disease in the Middle East. So there is some experience with some of those medicines and there is reason to believe that they may also have some effect against this new coronavirus. Uh, but um, they have been shown to work in the test tube and in experimental animal models, but not um, proven to provide benefit in humans, but some of these are being used at the moment. There are also uh, newer medicines which are now undergoing clinical trials in China. Um, and uh, we are waiting to see what the results of those trials are. Um, and uh, that may be uh, an option uh, in the future. But at the moment, there is no very clearly proven medicine that works against uh, this COVID-19 virus. Uh, now regarding, uh, but, but having said that, I think it's important to realize that even if there is no specific drug against the virus, there are many measures in terms of managing the patient, uh, providing oxygen, providing air, uh, ventilation and support for the breathing, which can be life-saving. So just to give an example, for dengue, also there is no specific medicine against dengue. But as you know, early diagnosis and early treatment can be life-saving and you can reduce the uh, bad outcomes to a minimum, right? Uh, now regarding vaccines, um, there are no vaccines at the moment. And although there are vaccines in development, it will take at least one year or longer before they can be uh, moved into human clinical trials, shown to be safe in humans, and then uh, uh, available for use in humans. So certainly for the next year or so, there won't be a vaccine that is available for human use. Can certain food items such as garlic prevent the COVID-19 infection? Well, these are indeed myths. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that garlic or any other common foods uh, can protect against this uh, disease. Um, of course, what is important is to have a good healthy diet, a good healthy lifestyle with uh, good exercise. So that is, that is good to build up resistance of your body to all infections, not just to this COVID-19 disease. But there is no specific uh, food item that uh, has been proven to provide any benefit uh, against this particular disease.
What are your suggestions to housemaids and caregivers who live overseas to prevent COVID-19 infections? Yes, yeah, so um, of course there are two possible sources of infection. Uh, one is maybe if the person you're looking after is is infected with COVID-19. Now in that situation, obviously that person should be in hospital, uh, right? But if there is, if the person is having respiratory disease, um, then it would make sense for the for the caregiver to maybe wear a mask uh, and in, pay particular attention to hand hygiene, right? Um, now I will explain about hand hygiene in a minute. Now outside the specific connection with with your your person or caregiver or person in the home, of course you uh, the person you know the, the the workers may be moving around going to crowded places. So crowded places uh, as much as possible should be avoided in this context because the infection is transmitted at fairly close range. So that is the situation where transmission may occur outside the home. And if you are in such crowded places, you're going in a bus or whatever it is, you have to keep in mind that um, your hands may get contaminated because somebody who has the infection may be coughing, uh, the virus gets on his or her hand, he touches maybe something in the bus and you touch the same railing or whatever it is. And then you touch your eyes, mouth or nose, you can get infected in that way. So it is important that when you are in public places, be careful of your hands. Don't touch your eyes, mouth and nose until you can go to a place where you can either wash your hands properly or use a alcohol hand rub or hand gel to clean your hands properly. So good hand hygiene is very important in reducing the risk of infection. But you have to also keep in mind that uh, you may take your phone and use that to touch the phone for whatever purpose and then your phone may be contaminated as well so it would make sense also to to make sure that you wipe your phone um, again with uh, maybe an alcohol hand wipe uh, before you use it because again that may be another source of contamination what is your message to those who are trying to go back to their home countries from high risk areas to prevent covid 19 infection so I think from what we can see at the moment, this virus is spreading worldwide. Uh, unfortunately, there won't be, I think there won't be any country that will escape uh, ultimately being affected by, by this virus. So I'm, I'm not really sure whether, uh, you know, going to Sri Lanka or going somewhere else is necessarily going to be uh, beneficial or protect, protective and you have to also keep in mind that in order to travel overseas you have to go through airports you have to go through crowded places again which is also a, a, a risk uh, situation so i think you have to think carefully uh, i mean uh, not just assume that um, you know moving from there to sri lanka is necessarily going to be protective um, of course there may be particular reasons um, way out why you might want to do that but you have to don't assume that this is always uh, necessarily the best thing to do